We've got an interesting title of the sermon this evening. This comes from verse number one of where we read there in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And the title of my sermon is Dead Flies Stink. Dead Flies Stink. I know it's kind of funny, right? I can see the kids back there laughing and even the adults. But uh, I, want that, I want that phrase to be able to stick with you because there is an analogy that's given in Ecclesiastes 10.1. There's an illustration given here. It says in verse number one, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So what that means is, you know, there's some older language, you know, it's, it's, it's really not that hard to understand. And you probably get an idea of this already, what it's talking about. But basically, when it's talking about like ointment, it could be anything from like, you know, just think of like perfume or something that you would put on to kind of make yourself smell better. So the, the point here is that there's this ointment or something that you would use to, to pour over yourself. Remember, um, Mary poured the alabaster box of ointment over Jesus and it was a very pricey thing, a very expensive thing. And, you know, Judas, the thief, was, was upset because he wanted to get some money out of it and he couldn't. And... Uh, but, but what, what she did was basically was just anointing him with a, with a very nice, a very nice smelling ointment over him. I, we think of ointment, sometimes you think of like antibiotic ointment or something like that is a little bit different. Um, but the point of that ointment is to, is to smell good, right? And what this is saying is that when, when flies come and land in that, that ointment and lands in there and they die, that sends forth a really stinking say. What it does is it, it ruins it, right? Because the whole point of it is to smell real good. Oh man, this is real nice. Smell like, and you get some dead flies in there, and it's like only. And it doesn't take very much. It just takes you know some dead, a few dead flies or whatever, and you got the whole thing of ointment. And now it's it's and. <laughs> When you mix like a good smell with a bad smell, in my opinion, I think it's even just worse. Like it's one thing to have a bad smell, but you know how like sometimes at restaurants and stuff and they have like these extra aerosol sprayers and stuff and like you're mixing that in with like oh, what's, a, what's a bad smell, right? It's like just leave the bad smell alone. Just got to let it air out. When you mix that together, I think it just makes it even worse. And this is kind of what's happening here. You have, you have these dead flies and something that's supposed to smell really good. So now you have this mix of like a good smell with these dead flies and it's just a stinking savor. Now, what is that being related to? Well, the rest of the verse says, so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So the same way that these this little bit, maybe a few dead flies can just corrupt and damage all of that good smelling ointment and just make it so it doesn't smell good at all anymore. A little bit of folly. What's folly? Folly is just foolishness. Folly, you know, it's probably talking about something sinful. I mean, the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. So we know that that's a sin even just thinking about it. But getting into just a little bit of foolishness, a little, just dabbling in with sin, you know, getting into some things that you know you shouldn't be getting into for a person, especially for a person who has a reputation, someone who is known to have wisdom, someone who is known to be honorable, someone who has already established and, you know, gotten a lot of sins out of their life and is someone to be looked up to, someone that you can go and seek counsel from. They're known for having wisdom. They're known for having honor. When you get to that point in your life, watch out because just a little bit of folly is going to ruin your whole reputation. That's what it's annoying to. So is it, it's a sweet smelling savor. It's a good thing to be wise. It's a good thing to have good counsel. It's a good thing to be held in honor, right? That's what we all should be striving for, that we could live an upright life and people can look to you as a good example, and you could get people to maybe, you know, hey, you could say, hey, follow me as I follow Christ the way that the Apostle Paul did. Say, I'm going to be a good example for you. I'm going to set my life to live for him, and you can look at the way I'm doing it, and you can come follow me. And when you get into foolishness, and when you allow just folly to enter into your life, you can do a lot of damage. You could ruin your entire reputation. It's very similar to trust, right? You, you, could, you could trust someone. One of the biggest things that you could, you know, the, the 
The most trust you have is probably in your family members, right? Your spouse. You should be able to trust your spouse more than anybody else. You know, I trust them. Because you make that bond together. You make a vow and you come together and you're, you, know, you two have become one and you trust each other and you trust each other and you should be able to do that. That's the way it ought to be. But as soon as someone does something, you're caught in a lie, right? You're, you're, you're caught doing something you ought not to be doing. That trust is, is broken. And sometimes it can be broken, you know, almost beyond repair, and just root, you know, you could have a long relationship with somebody and you have this trust for so long and then a little bit of folly. It, it could only take one time of doing something and just destroy so much good that you have built up to that point. And we need to be very, very careful on how we live our lives and what we allow ourselves to do and be a part of it and just keep these things in mind. Because, you know, some people say, oh, I don't care what other people think about me. And in one sense, there's a little bit of wisdom to that. If you mean it in the sense that I don't care what other people think about me in regards to if you're going to ridicule me for being a Bible-believing Christian, I don't care what you think about me. Right? If you're gonna if you're gonna speak evil of me because I follow Christ, I don't care what you think about me. But you know what? I do care what people think about me. As a pastor of this church, I care what my congregation thinks about me. As a, a husband and a, and a father, I care what my family thinks about me. I can, you know I think it's important that people can think highly of me and rightfully so. I do care about that. I want to be upright. I want to be known for wisdom and honor. And that is something that I am striving for every day. And that's not something that happens overnight. People aren't just held in high regard for wisdom and honor just by just after one day, oh, you just meet someone. Oh, all of a sudden they're just held in high. No, it takes a long time to build up to that point, to, to gain trust, to, to demonstrate that you are worthy of honor. And it could take a very, very short amount of time to flush it all down the toilet. And this is something that we need to be mindful of because your reputation affects your testimony. If you really do love the Lord and you love the lost, you're going to want to do everything that you can to try to reach these people, Amen. right? That's why the Apostle Paul said, hey, follow me like I'm following Christ. He loved them and he's given them that example. But as soon as someone sees you, you know, getting into some folly, why would they ever want to listen to you? And this, is, this works detrimentally kind of on two sides. So the one side, the people that witness you getting into folly... They're going to look at you and be like, I don't want to listen to that hypocrite. Oh, Mr. Christian supposedly lives this great life, and then I, I saw him at that party getting drunk last week. There he is preaching, you know, about how foolish it is to get drunk. And, he, you know, he's quoting Proverbs 23, and then here he is getting involved in the folly that, that you know, I thought, I thought he was wise. I thought he was someone that had wisdom. They don't want to listen. And then on the flip side, what that does then, it also works against you. I know it did for me where I don't want to say anything anymore because I don't want to sound like the hypocrite. I don't want to be, you know, telling people. I, for the longest time after I got saved, I brought this up, I think, at the, at the conference. But right when I, the, the, the day I got saved or the day after I got saved, I got saved at night in my bedroom. The next day, you know, I woke up and what, whatever happened that day, I don't remember exactly, but I lived with three other guys. And I told them all. I told them, like, hey, I got saved last night. I didn't really know how to explain it to them. You know, I, I, all, all I knew was that I called on the name of the Lord. I called on Jesus Christ to save me, knowing that I needed a Savior, and he did. And I know from that moment that I had eternal life. And it was difficult to kind of explain it. So like, they're like, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You know, they asked me some questions. And... 
Couldn't explain it. I was just excited, you know. I'm excited about the salvation. I want to tell people. I told my friends back home too. The next time I went back home and visited, like, hey man, yeah, I got this saved. It's you know, it's great. You, should, you know, like, in, in trying to tell them about Jesus. Again, not very effectively. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't get plugged into a good church. I didn't really get plugged into my Bible very well. You know, I didn't know a lot. I had not a lot of knowledge. I was a newborn babe, but it was important. But after some time went by, you know, I tried to get, I, I, I tried some churches, I tried to get plugged in, didn't happen. I ended up walking in my flesh and not in my spirit. I ended up not allowing myself or not putting forth the effort to really grow, to really do anything. And I didn't really have anyone else that much to, to kind of help me out along the way either, right? But I knew I was saved. And there's a lot of things that even though I wasn't super knowledgeable on a lot of things, there's a lot of things I still knew. I still knew it was sinful to go out and be getting drunk or getting high or fornicating. You know, all of these things. Like, I knew that they're all sins. I, it's not that hard to know right from wrong in a very general sense in many areas of life. But as a result of my choice then to live a life of foolishness, and to do folly, what that did for me then was prevent me from ever saying anything about Jesus after that. After, after a little while, you know, just the, the excitement kind of faded off. I always knew it was important. It was, I mean, I was saved. I had the Holy Spirit inside of me for years. For all, I still do. Right? <laughs> and you know what? It's forever. But there are times then, that, you know, I started working at a pool hall after I moved out here and just, you know, the crowd I ha hung with was similar to the crowd I was in, you know, same, same stuff. But when situations then would come up, you know, about God, I felt ashamed or embarrassed and would want to change the conversation because I knew what the truth was, but I felt so embarrassed based on my behavior. And I just, I didn't even want to say anything because I'm thinking, how can I say anything with the way that I'm behaving, the way that I'm living? And that's a shame. And that's what it'll do to you if you have, if you have any sense of, of that type of not wanting to be a hypocrite when you talk to people. That's what it'll do to you. So not only will people actually not really want to listen to what you have to say because they see you doing things, you know, but you're going to impact yourself of not wanting to do what God wants you to do. A little bit of folly does a lot of damage. Now, I wasn't someone who was held in reputation for wisdom and honor, right? Because I had just gotten saved. I mean, this is not like, like um, I was destroying what I had worked years to build up. But I'm just saying, though, that that, that sense, that, um, that desire to want to, to give the gospel to people or whatever, will go away when you start getting yourself involved in folly in foolishness in sin. And we need to be careful because it's a two-edged sword. We need to be very careful with that. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left hand. Now, you might see this sometimes and wonder, like, why does the Bible even reference, you know, your right hand or your left hand? What's the big deal? Right? Like, I've got a daughter that's left-handed. Does that really matter? No. That doesn't. But what the, what the Bible is illustrating here, so like in the vast majority of people, the right hand is the dominant hand. It's the strong hand, right? It's the one that, that most commonly is known as being where your strength is going to be. And what this is saying is that the wise man's heart is being held in your right hand because your heart is important. Keeping your heart pure, keeping your heart right. You value that, so you are using the most strength that you have to kind of keep your heart, to keep your heart right. And then it says, but a fool's heart is at his left. There's other things that the fool cares about than keeping his heart right. So he's like, yeah, I'll just put my heart over into this hand. You know, it's, it's going to be a lot easier for me to, to drop it or to, 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 to get shaken or to, you know, lose my strength as opposed to using their dominant hand. Let's be wise with our heart because your heart is going to, is gonna, you know, when your heart is right, 
you'll be avoiding the folly. When you're, when you, when you're not guarding your heart as well, then you're going to be opening yourself up to, oh yeah, that looks kind of fun. Verse number three, Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Now, this doesn't tie in as much with my sermon, but I just love this verse because, <laughs> because fools just have a way of letting themselves be known unto people. You know, all they have to do is open up their mouth, which that's one of the ways a fool is known is because they do just open up their mouths on a lot of things and just let the whole world know that they're a fool. So if you want to be wise, the first tip is to just speak less. <laughs> just speak less. Hold some of the things that you might be thinking that you would just normally blurt out. Hold that stuff inside. Even if you're not wise, you'll still be seen as being wise because you're not going to be let everyone know, hey, I'm a fool, okay? But the reason why there's wisdom in that is because we, we need to have a filter, right? You need to be able to, to not just say the first thing that pops into your head and, and get your heart right with God so that, you know, what, where does wisdom ultimately come from? It doesn't come from within. It comes from God's word. I mean, this, this is truth. This is where we get our wisdom. So the more you understand about God's word, the more you will be wise and be able to provide wise counsel and be held in honor because you could be someone that can help people understand or illuminate them to God's word. That's what helps you be wise. And if you get a reputation for knowing your Bible well, for knowing God's word and, and providing that good advice and good counsel and having wisdom, man, what a shame is that to then get caught up in even just a little bit of folly. It's a little bit of foolishness. You should know better. And we need to be careful about that. You know, the Bible says a similar concept with a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Right? It doesn't take very much then to do a lot of damage. In the book of James, it talks about your tongue, you know, being just this small member and look at how much damage it can do. Well, a little bit of folly for someone who already has established a good reputation, a godly reputation, a little folly is going to do a lot of damage also. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 13. That little bit of folly, that little bit of foolishness, that's the dead flies. And that's going to cause your, your life to stink. The little bit of foolishness you want to just give in to because you get so weary or tired of doing the right thing. You just want to give in to your flesh. It's a bad choice. Keep this, these verses in mind. Just The next time you're tempted... And you've got that flesh just, just telling you, just do it. No one's around. No one will see you or whatever. Just think of the dead flies. Just be like, think about eating dead flies. You're like, I don't want to eat dead flies, right? I'm not going to take a drink of that beer because I, I don't want, that's like dead flies right there. I don't want to, you know, get tempted with fornication or whatever. Like that, that just, just. Put that thought of dead flies into your mind and hopefully that'll, that'll remind you of the stench of sin and, and, and how bad it really is because it's easy to get deceived by things and to think foolishly, oh, maybe this would be a little bit of fun. Because it won't be. It won't be. And the more you know God's word and the more you're being used of God, you know what? The less fun it's going to be anyways. Maybe when you were unsaved, you could have fun with some things. Maybe when you were newly saved, some of the sinful things still kind of seem fun to you, but you know what? The more you get it, the, the, the less it's going to be. God's going to chasten you. He's going to whoop you <laughs> and make sure you're not, gonna have, you're not even going to have the, 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 the little pleasure of sin for a season. It's just, he's just going to be like, no, it's not worth it. And on top of all that, of course, you're going to be just ruining and destroying 
what takes so long to build up. First Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So this is saying, basically, don't worry about it. Actually, you could be happy when people falsely accuse you and they want to drag your good name down. You know, you're held in honor. You're held as someone who has wisdom. And other people that hate God, that hate you, they want to drag your name down. And the Bible says, you know what, you can be happy about that. Even though that we, we are careful about our reputation, we care about our reputation, there's, when you know that you're doing right, you don't have to worry about defending your reputation. You don't have to get caught up in all of these things where people are just lying about you. Don't worry about it. Because your rep, God will make sure that, that when you are doing what's right, that that'll come to light. That, that the wickedness and the lies, it'll all work itself out. You don't have to defend yourself. Other people will defend you. God will defend you. The key is you making sure that you're right in your heart. So when you're suffering for righteousness sake, you can be happy about that. No big deal. Keep moving forward. And that's what it's saying here. But look at the next verse though. In verse number 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. If you're suffering because of your sin, because you brought it on yourself, that is not good. That is not a reason to rejoice. That is not something to be, to be proud of or to be happy about. That's something that you just have to receive. He's saying if it's happening because you didn't do anything and people are just persecuting you, you're doing good. You'd be happy about that. But not when you're doing it because you're evil doing, because you're in sin. Flip over, if you would, to chapter number five. Because in order to prevent this little bit of folly, we need to be sober-minded. Of course, sober-minded in the sense of not influenced by drugs and alcohol, but not just in that regard. Sober-minded means serious. It means you're grave. It means you're putting importance on things. That life isn't just a big joke. That everything isn't just some game. That if everything isn't just all about laughs and having fun. Because when you have that type of a mindset, it's a lot easier to end up doing foolish things and just getting all in front. Now, look, I like laughing and having fun just as much as everyone else does. I'm not saying that it's a sin to laugh, to tell jokes, right, or to have a good time. It's not. But what I'm doing is I'm talking about a characteristic of how you treat life and how you treat your life here. You can joke around and have fun. Everyone, you need to do that from time. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to do. But that should not just be what characterizes who you are and what you think life is all about because it's not. We need to be sober. We need to be serious. There is a serious job to be done here. I mean, think about just going to work sometime. You know, it, you could cut it up with some people and have a little bit of fun on the job, but what are you there for? You're there to work. You're there to do a job, right? If, if the boss sees someone and they're just joking around all the time and they can never take anything serious, they're not going to get very far, and I'd be surprised if they don't end up getting fired. Right? Because the boss wants someone who's going to work. Now, he might not give you a hard time if you're, you know, if you're doing a good job. Yeah, you have some fun with it. Yeah, you enjoy it. Great. That's probably going to help you out even more to be able to enjoy your work and to do it with fun. But you don't need to just be jesting all the time and just, and just having a, not a serious attitude. And God's the same way. He's got a job for us to do. He's got work for us. And he wants us being serious about it. He wants us to be grave and sober-minded. And in 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. You need to be on guard. 
You need to be aware. You need to be aware of surroundings, aware of what's going on around you. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. There are enemies. There is an adversary. Satan is an adversary. He's looking to destroy and to devour your life. And if you're walking around thinking everything's just a big joke, you're not going to see the lion waiting for you in the path that's going to pounce on you and destroy you and get you into that folly to destroy your reputation because everything's just a big joke. That's why we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. Be on guard. Be ready. Prepare yourself. Have your heart in your right hand and not just put it off into your left or put it in your back pocket. Guard your heart. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be prepared for this so that you don't fall. Look, we all get into sin at some time or another. There's, there's always going to be some level of backsliding at some point in your life. Now, I'm not saying that to, to endorse it or anything. It's just reality. But we need to be able to catch ourselves as soon as possible or at least prevent ourselves from getting that point. You want to get to the point to where, yes, we sin, but you don't even allow that to backslide. It's just, oh man, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to get back right, like right away and be vigilant about it. Be on top of things. Don't start indulging yourself into foolishness. So when you make the allowances for the sin in your life is when you really get in trouble. That's when it's going to be a big deal. Turn, if you would, to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. See, Satan knows that even getting you to stumble a little could end up resulting in a great fall. Just tripping you up a little bit. Right? You're making great strides spiritually. And what's he going to try to do? He's going to try to do a, do a nice little swipe at your foot right, to get you to stumble. Because you might just keep stumbling and then crash down hard. Yep. He doesn't have to do much more than just the, the foot swipe to get you to, to fall the rest of the way. That's right. Snowball effect. But if you're on guard, you may stumble, right? He puts something in your path and that makes you stumble a little bit. But because you're vigilant and you're, and, you're, and, you're, and you're being aware and you're more sober-minded and you've got your heart in your right hand, you're not going to let that actually cause you to fall. You're going to regain your, your footing and your stepping and keep moving forward. That little bit of folly that you allow can significantly hamper your spiritual effectiveness and cause you to lose your credibility. That's what, that's what uh, Ecclesiastes 10.1 is warning you about. Losing your credibility, losing your reputation that you have to work really hard to gain. Now, let's say that does happen. It still doesn't mean you're out of the game, but you have been seriously set back. So the last thing you want to have happen is say, well, I'm set back this far, I'm just going to give up and quit. That is a failure. If something happens along the way, you get involved in folly, you ruin a reputation, what you need to do is get back up and start repairing, just, just try to rebuild and regain. That's not a failure. Even if you stumble and fall like that and you get back up, as long as you're not quitting, your life won't result as a failure. But as soon as you give up, there's no more hope after that, right? You just, you, I mean, you might as well die. But see, as long as you're here and God has you, he's got work for you to do. And we need to be able to pick ourselves back up and keep moving forward. But better than that, don't even, let, don't even allow yourself to get into the folly to begin with. You don't have to. There's plenty of people that, that, that can live a life Devoted to God, not perfectly, but can still live their life with their heart right with God. And that's, what, that's the goal for us. We want to do the very, that very same thing. Deal with the struggles and the challenges that come our way, but keep, keep 
the sober mindset and try to maintain that, that reputation the whole way through by not getting involved in foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. We need to take heed to ourselves. Don't ever get to the point of where you think, based on your great reputation and honor that you have no way i could ever get involved in such and such a sin no way that could ever happen to me better take heed i bet david got to a point in his life where he's like there's no way i would ever commit adultery there's no way that would ever happen We need to take heed to ourselves. But after that verse of taking heed, we're left with, with actually a really good promise from God. Saying that whatever temptation you get through, you know, there's no temptation taking you, but such is a common to man. Other people have gone through the same thing that you go through, no matter what it is. Other people are tempted by the same things. You're not alone. And not only that, God is, has provided and allowed so that no matter what situation you're in, he's allowing you a way out, a way to escape. Now, the choice is going to be yours. You still have to make the choice to, to get that exit door from that temptation so you don't just follow along down that, that foolish path. But he will provide it. There's no way it's going to be, I had no choice. There's no way out. I just had to do it. No, you didn't. Because otherwise, then the Bible's not true. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 14. Now, our own reputation is extremely important. We also need to be careful so that we, um, the way that we walk, that the, and, you know, the, the way that we live our life is not negatively impacting others even when we're not necessarily sinning. So the, the mindset here that we need to, to have is, because why does it matter what your reputation is? Anyways, it matters for other people, right? It matters because you want to be influential in a positive way to help people. So when you build up a good reputation, you'll be able to be more effective and reach more people and, and be able to influence them and to help them out in their walk with God, right? Because otherwise, it doesn't even matter. Like it doesn't, your, your reputation doesn't really matter for you unless you care about getting some accolades or whatever. But if you care about that, your heart's not right anyways. And you care about the wrong things and you're going to end up going, going about it the wrong way. That's already foolishness. But the reason why we care is because we want it Help out more people. You're, you're, you're focused on other people. That's why you care about the reputation anyways. So keeping that in mind, there are other things that we can do that may not be sinful but can still impact other people. And We need to have the focus and the mindset of how does what I do impact other people? What are other people going to do with this? Uh, look if you would at verse number 12 of Romans 14. The Bible says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We all have personal responsibility. At the end of the day, everything still boils down to yourself. So even people that might be following you, if you screw up and do something wrong, and then they look at what you did and they screw up too, they're still responsible for their own actions. But you don't want to be a bad influence on them. So we're all, we're all going to give account of ourselves to God. Look at verse number 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably 
destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So what he's saying is that don't, you know, just because you know, he's saying, yeah, there's nothing unclean just of itself. You know, like in God's creation, like it's, it's not just unclean. It's not, you know, things are unclean for a reason. And he's talking about, you know, eating food, right? There is, especially in the New Testament, you know, the dietary restrictions have been lifted. There's nothing unclean of itself, right? That, that part of God's law is done away with. The carnal ordinances have been fulfilled. They're done. So, but if you have someone, if you have a brother, someone who else is a believer, and they've got a problem, like a serious problem, and they think that something's a sin, you don't just go and just rub it in their face and cause a stumbling block for them or entice them then to, because you see, you're like, I know this isn't sinful to eat, but they think it is. And you're like, hey, hey come on, why don't, you, why don't you come over here and, and have a, um, you know, a carnitas taco or something? And they think it's a sin to eat pork, right? And it's like, you're, you're enticing them because what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up causing, you, you'd be like, eh, it's not a big deal. It's not a sin to eat anyways, right? Well, if they think it is, it is a sin for them. And that's causing a stumbling block for them. Now, it doesn't mean you can't try to teach them from God's word what, you know, what the truth is, but we need to be charitable in, in thinking about other people, be minded about them and where they're at, even if they're wrong, we don't want to, to, to make some, do something that would cause them to stumble. Because again, that would, that would be foolishness. Why, why would you want to cause a brother in Christ to stumble? So again, the things that we do, they'll affect our reputation, they'll affect other people. Um, turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's the last place I'll be turned. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 talks a lot about false prophets, right? reprobates. One thing that a false prophet does very, very often is it brings a reproach upon the name of Christ. Even though they're not a believer, they do a lot of damage based on their actions. 2 Peter 2.1 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom? The way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So because of these false prophets, what they end up doing is that there actually is a way of truth. There's a way that's right. There's a, a true Christianity. And what the false prophets do is because they're claiming to be Christian, but then they end up destroying people's lives. They end up being pedophiles. They end up just ruining people and just using people for money or whatever it is that they're all about, right? That's not about Christ. It's not about God. They bring a bad name, a bad rap, a bad reputation in destroying people's lives on the actual right way. I mean, how many times do you meet people that say, I want nothing to do with organized religion. I want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. I want nothing to do with church. Because they were defiled or had something happen to a family member of theirs or they were in just some false religion and some false prophet destroyed them. And, the, and it brings this reproach on Christ. It makes the way of truth actually be evil spoken of. Because the person that was affected by that, they don't know the way of truth, but they think it's the same thing. But it's actually the right way. It's just now it's just being evil spoken of because of the damage that they did. Now, why am I bringing this up? You say, well, I'm not a false prophet. Well, because the way that you act and the things that you do can still have the same type of a consequence that the false prophet has. If you're not careful with how you live and, and, and how you walk, you might end up just turning people away so bad because you get involved in some folly or some foolishness that people just say, well, I knew this guy and man, I really thought that he was a Christian. I really thought he was sincere. I mean, he really seemed to, to walk the walk and talk the talk. And, and the things that he, that, I, that, that he would do, 
you know, he explained from the Bible why he did that. And you know what? He seemed, he seemed to be very sincere and very honest. And then you end up doing something and just completely destroying someone else's, you know, understanding of truth. Maybe, you know, they're not saved or whatever. Now, look, is it right for a person to, to base everything about the Bible or Christianity on what one person does? Of course not. That's not right. But does it happen? You better believe it happens. It's, it's, it's the way things are in many cases. And we need to be aware of that and sensitive to that and just, just you know, you don't want anything that you do to bring any damage to the cause of Christ. The false prophets, they bring the damage. They're doing it many times on purpose. That's, you know, either they just don't care or they're doing it on purpose. But we don't want the way of truth to be evil spoken of. Because the God-haters will jump all over it. When you allow your good testimony, your reputation to be destroyed, it causes a lot of problems. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So we ought to do. We ought to depart from iniquity. We ought to get the sin out of our life. You name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Get away from it. Don't dabble in it. Don't, don't allow folly to enter into your life. Depart from it. Verse number 20, but in a great house, right? There's a house, there's a lot of people in the house, a great house. There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. When you allow yourselves to get caught up in folly and sin and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you are a vessel unto dishonor. Notice he doesn't say there's any neutral vessels. There's not neutral people in God's house. When you're a believer, you're either a vessel in honor or dishonor. The vessel unto honor, the vessel of gold, the vessel of silver is the one that is sober-minded, charitably-minded, con concerned about other people, and is not allowing folly to stink up their life like a bunch of dead flies. Very simple message this evening. Your reputation is important. So many things to be thinking about when that, that moment of temptation comes to you. But let this one thing stick with you. When the temptation comes, when the sin's knocking on the door, just think of a bunch of disgusting dead flies and how bad that stinks. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction and wisdom that you give us from your word. Lord, help us all to take heed to ourselves, especially as we, we do grow in knowledge or we grow in wisdom, we grow in honor among other people. Lord, help us not to get just full of ourselves or full of pride or to the point to where we think that, oh, there's no way that we could sin. Help us all to take heed. And Lord, I pray that, that these analogies that you've used in your word would sink in with us and, and that we can, we can store these things in our memory and, and that um, we, we'd really just um, be able to stop ourselves in, in these moments of temptations and that you'd just um, help us through, help us to be strengthened, help us to be a good, a good role model for other people, for younger people in the church, for, for new believers, just for for other people to see how we are to live and how we are to serve you, dear Lord. Help us to be strong, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.